Well, hello, my name is Brennan Spiegel, and I am the Director of Health Services Research here at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. And it's my pleasure to be with you today to talk about a new field of medicine that we call medical extended reality, or MXR. And this is the use of extended reality technologies like virtual reality, or VR, to help take care of patients across a wide range of different conditions. So I'm gonna get started and share my screen with you and start by showing you a picture of me with one of our patients at Cedar sinai Medical Center who has used virtual reality. And we've now used VR in over 3000 patients at Cedar sinai Medical Center. And here's a patient who is considering whether to use virtual reality to help manage her pain. And I'll talk more today about how we use virtual reality for pain management, along with a wide variety of other conditions. Now, when most people think of virtual reality, they think of headsets like these. And these are generally made for gaming and for entertainment, not necessarily to help take care of patients with medical conditions. But what I'm hoping to prove to you today is that these technologies can be used for much more than merely games and entertainment, that they can actually be used to profoundly change our minds for the better. Now, in the meantime, we know that companies like Meta, formerly Facebook, have been using virtual reality mainly for gaming and for entertainment. And this is an announcement that Mark Zuckerberg made last year when he changed the name of Facebook to Meta. And the reason they're called Meta is because we're now going to soon see the emergence of the metaverse. And Zuckerberg and his company are one of many that are developing this metaverse of the future, which will be a new form of the internet where we experience the internet through extended reality technologies. And this concerns some people that this metaverse is not going to be a place of healing and a place of rest, and it actually could take us apart from one another and lose track of the real world. And that is a concern. But one thing we're trying to figure out in our research is how can we protect some small part of this metaverse to support human well being, to help alleviate suffering, to use extended reality or XR for good. Now, here is an example of that. This is a patient of ours at Cedar sinai who has sickle cell anemia. And moments before taking this picture, he was in considerable pain. But at this moment, you can see he's using virtual reality, and he's actually in a helicopter flying over Iceland. And you can see the emotional experience on his face. And that's the first thing I want to emphasize, is that virtual reality allows us to generate strong, very powerful, emotional experiences. More than just watching a movie, more than reading a book, more than reading some pamphlet about your disease, this allows people to engage deeply within environments that can be engineered to generate positive emotions. And you can see it on his face. And emotions matter because they allow us to remember things powerfully. Here is an example of another patient who has liver disease. She's been experiencing pain. And here we're trying to use virtual reality to manage her pain. And she is on a beach right now in Hawaii. Although you can see she's really in her hospital bed. But this is giving her an opportunity to escape to escape the four walls of her hospital room. And that's because escape matters. The ability to give people access to fantastical destinations, to go beyond the four walls of their hospital, beyond their mind and the illnesses that they are experiencing, to zoom away from their mind and into different worlds that are almost like psychedelic worlds. And we find that when we use this, it can help patients feel better, not just when they have the headset on, but even after they take the headset off. 
and they learn things in these experiences about themselves and about the world around them. Here's another example of a patient named Harmon Clark, who's allowed us to tell his story. He has Crohn's disease and has come into the hospital many times with pain and discomfort. He does not want to use pain medication, so he uses virtual reality. And here you can see that he has this look of awe on his face, this look of wonderment. And awe matters. This idea that in his case, he's floating around the earth from space and looking back on the earth gives him a sense that he's part of a larger global community and that he's not alone with his illness and with his suffering. And this can even give people goosebumps, literally give them the chills like astronauts have when they're looking back upon the earth. And in fact, this has been studied. This is a study called, Are You Odd Yet? How Virtual Reality Gives Us Awe and Goosebumps from Simon Fraser University in Canada, where they posited that VR could help make self-transcendent and transformative experiences of awe more accessible to individuals by flying them around their city, then flying them over the, um, the, the countryside and the mountains and eventually to outer space. And while they're doing this, they had a camera right on their arm measuring the amount of goosebumps that they were able to generate. So this is a key part of virtual reality is it can help generate emotions. It can help generate Emotions in a way that this man, Mel Slater, has been studying for many years. This is Mel Slater at the University of Barcelona. And I visited him, and I want to briefly tell you a story about what happened when I visited his laboratory. Because it's a story that combines those features of emotion and awe and wonderment. And so here is a picture of a room from his laboratory. And there's a chair and there's a table. And he sat me down in that chair and I kicked my feet out on the table. And then they put a camera um, on me and they put a headset on my face. And then all of a sudden that room looked like this. And this is me looking around in that room. And you can see it now looks like a beautiful living space. And I can see my legs there. Then they drew some lines on the table, blue lines. And they said, trace out the lines with your feet. And I did it. And I started to wonder, whose legs are those? Because they look like my legs and they feel like my legs, but I know that those are digital legs. And this is where virtual reality starts to separate real from virtual. And they start to come together actually. And then they drop some balls from the ceiling. And as each ball hit me, I could feel it, literally feel it hit my body because a vibration engine would fire. And now what happened after I had engaged this body and occupied this body is they separated me from the body. I started to float up to the ceiling. This is me leaving my body. The balls are following me. I can still feel them, reminding me that I have a body. But as I look down, I realized that I had left the body that I had just been in. And more than that, the body was not moving. The body was dead. I was having an out of body experience. And I'm showing it to you again here. Very emotionally powerful experience for me. And it turns out Professor Slater has studied this. This is an example of a study called a virtual out-of-body experience reduces fear of death. So this is very profound that something like virtual reality can do more than just games and entertainment. It could even change perspectives about something like death. So I start with this because it emphasizes that VR is a tool that can modify perceptions, perceptions of the world around us and perceptions of the world within us. And if it's used to recalibrate unhealthy perceptions, then VR and XR has potential to become a radical new therapy that can be used to improve quality of life. Now, we know that this is the case because there's been research looking at this. This is a famous study from Hunter Hoffman at the University of Washington from 2007. And what you're looking at are two functional MRI scans of the brain in a single person who on the left is experiencing pain. On the right, is experiencing pain with virtual reality headsets. And you'll notice that there's fewer signals on the right than on the left, but also the location of those signals. Here, the signals are in the sensory cortex. That's where you feel the physical experience of pain, but also in the middle, in the insula, in the limbic system, 
in the emotion centers of the brain. Both of those areas are tamped down or reduced in virtual reality. And it turns out this has also been seen clinically. These are two famous randomized controlled trials using virtual reality. On the left, for people with severe burn injuries undergoing dressing changes. And on the right, for women going through labor and delivery. And in both cases, they were randomized between virtual reality and no virtual reality. Here, the virtual reality is the black bar. Here, the virtual reality is the white bar. And you'll notice that in both cases, they looked at both the sensory experience, how bad was the pain intensity, the cognitive experience, how much time did you spend thinking about the pain, and the emotional or affective experience, how unpleasant was the pain. And in both studies, virtual reality reduced both the severity, the cognitive, sensory, and affective components of pain, and it increased fun, which is an interesting outcome. Now, we've been going in our lab a step further by measuring sensory data. This is an example of a virtual reality headset that we use that when it all comes together has sensory systems embedded within it. So we can measure the nervous system. We can measure the pupil diameter, heart rate variability, heart rate, eye tracking. And this gives us something called cognitive load. And here's an example of that. This is me wearing a virtual reality headset with sensors on it. And I am trying to meditate in a beach. And so I start to meditate and you can see that my cognitive load drops quickly and I'm meditating peacefully here. Then my colleague walks in and interrupts my meditation with a conversation and you can see how it comes back up. Then he leaves and I meditate again. Then he breaks my concentration again and so on and so forth. So this is an example where we can use virtual reality to actually measure what's happening essentially to the nervous system. Now, here is an example with an actual patient. What I'm going to show you in a second is the video of this. In this room, there is a patient. You can't see the patient, but she has very significant pain and anxiety. And on the right, you are seeing what she is seeing. She is in that environment, completely immersed in it. We're just looking at a two-dimensional version of it, but she is breathing slowly in and out, with this mandala that expands and contracts and she breathes in and out and paces her breathing with that. At the same time, we're measuring her cognitive load. And this is striking because you can see that she was anxious and upset here. And then as soon as we started the virtual reality, it was almost like she was hypnotized. And she right about here said that she felt that she was in heaven. She was in heaven with her son. Her son had died in a car accident, tragically. Right about here, she started to cry, and she said she was with God. Now, it doesn't always happen like that, but when it happens, it's quite profound. And so we've been doing this for quite some time and noticing something very powerful about this technology. And the powerful thing is that somebody like the patient I just described may have a body that is in pain, a body that has betrayed her. But even if our body betrays us, we still can alter how our brain perceives that body through the gift of neuroplasticity given to us by evolution. We are able to change the way our brain can experience the world and can change the way we experience our own body. And that's what virtual reality is doing. It's no different than what Buddhist monks do with mindful meditation or other transcendental religious experiences. It's just making it more accessible and easy to access for everyday people who don't have time to become Buddhist monks. Now, this is my hospital, Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. We have the largest hospital in the Western United States. And in this hospital, we use virtual reality. This is an example of one of the patient rooms in our hospital and patients who are in a bed like this all day long, this is what they look at. They see the roof, the ceiling, they see a television. They see somebody like me who comes in, a doctor, maybe not I'm sm- not smiling, then I leave. 
Then I come back again all day long. This is what it's like to be in the hospital. So we've been thinking, can we do better than that? Can we give people the opportunity to escape the four walls of their hospital room, to go to fantastical destinations? In this case, this patient is watching a blue whale swim across her visual field, and she's reaching out to it. And we've been talking to our patients and learning from them for the past seven years now about what works and what doesn't work. What do they think about this technology? How does it feel? How would they like to use it? Where would they like to go? Some people just want to go on a vacation to Hawaii or go to an ice cave or go on a safari. Other people are using it for cognitive behavioral therapy, for sleep therapy, for stroke rehabilitation therapy. The list goes on and on. Now, I want to show you now two patients using virtual reality for the first time so you can see for yourself what it's like for people who are using virtual reality. So we'll see uh, if it helps with the pain or not. Mm -hmm. um, you'll tell us. Yes. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Any okay. questions about that? Pull that down over your eyes now. Should load up. Whoa. What do you see? Um, horses. Yep. Okay. And over the bridge. Is that is mm -hmm. that working? Yes. What's happening now? The helicopter. Waterfalls. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been to Iceland? No. With the music and everything, it's real peaceful. Oh, it's people. Hey. So you can see how he's interacting with the virtual reality experience. And both of them are uh, telling me how transformative it was really to be in virtual reality. So now we've been doing this at Cedar sinai Medical Center. And this is an example of a trial that we did a randomized control trial of virtual reality for pain. And in this study, we took 140 people in the hospital who all had pain and randomized them to either virtual reality, they had a library of experiences that they kept with them by the bed. They used it three times per day for 10 minutes at a time and as needed for breakthrough pain, or they had a control condition where they were able to watch a television set with health and wellness programming. And so when we looked across the course of their hospital stay, we found that people in the VR arm had a larger reduction in pain that they reported during their hospital stay compared to the group in the television arm. But when we looked at those with the most severe pain, scores of eight or nine or 10 out of 10, there we saw the largest reduction in VR compared to the television. Now, this is another example of a recent study here, not in the hospital, but outside of the hospital. And this was an eight week study for people with chronic lower back pain. It's an at home behavioral skills based VR program called Ease VRX. And in this study, every day for 56 days, patients had a lesson in virtual reality about psychoeducation, about biofeedback training, about the nature of pain. The control group had a sham virtual reality headset where they just saw a two-dimensional screen of animals walking around, nothing special, just a control for the virtual reality headset. And when they monitored their pain intensity over the course of the, of the eight weeks, they found a separation with a larger reduction in the group that received virtual reality. Now, as a result of this, in the United States, the Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, actually authorized this virtual reality program back in November of 2021. And we are now seeing more examples of software programs going up to regulatory agencies like the FDA for approval. And we're going to see more and more of this. Now we're doing our own research, also looking at lower back pain, also looking at a sham VR. And here we're also comparing it to a distraction virtual reality, just to see is it purely just the distraction or is it the skills-based training that is more impactful? And here you can see some of the scenes from this skills-based program, which includes psychoeducation, pain education, breath training, and so forth.
Now, there are many other topics that I could talk about today. I don't have enough time to cover everything, but we do have a conference every year in Los Angeles in March of 2023 will be the next one, uh, International Conference, where we hear over two days lectures about all of these different topics. So if virtual reality is a therapy, then we need a VR pharmacy. As a doctor, I need to pick the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. And the Food and Drug Administration agrees. This is a picture from a workshop called Medical Extended Reality that was created by the FDA just before the pandemic in March of 2020. And since then, we now call the field Medical Extended Reality, or MXR. If you want more information, we have a website. It's called virtualmedicine.org. On this website, you can find a lot of information about our program. You can see more videos of patients using virtual reality. You can read our research, and you can also learn more about our conference called Virtual Medicine or VMED, the VMED 23 conference. This is a bit of an old picture. will be coming up next year. I also wrote a book about this. It's called VRX, How Virtual Therapeutics Will Revolutionize Medicine which is also the title of this talk I'm giving to you. This was a book that was published in 2020 that describes this field and talks about how virtual reality is teaching us about the nature of human consciousness, about the nature of human suffering, and the opportunities that lie at the intersection between neurology and psychology, between behavioral health, technology, and clinical medicine. So because I'm here in Los Angeles and Hollywood, I'm going to end with a scroll of all the people that have helped to support the research that I showed you today. If you're interested, you can follow me on Twitter. This is my account. We also have our virtual medicine conference account here. And I wanna thank you again very much for the opportunity to speak today with you. And I hope that that was a useful, if not brief introduction to the new field of medical extended reality. Thank you very much.